Nice to be here. Uh, well, I want to talk about these four tales of impossibility. Um, you may or may not know what they are. You may know some and not all. Um, I'll fill you in on this. But first, I want to say a few things about impossibility. So uh, they said that human flight was impossible, but the Wright brothers proved them wrong. Uh, they said that the four-minute mile was impossible, uh, but Roger Bannister proved them wrong. Uh, even Shel Silverstein got in on the act. This was in uh, one of my kids' favorite books, Where the Sidewalk Ends, and one of my favorite books. Uh, it says, listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never-haves, then listen to me. Listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Right? So this is the American dream. Anything's possible. We, you know, you cannot say impossible. Uh, well, it's my sad duty to inform you that there are impossible things, and there are things that are proven to be impossible. Um, and so the four impossibility theorems that I'm going to talk about uh, are these, a, a class of problems called the ruler and compass problems. So these are things you can do with an ordinary compass like this. Uh, I say ruler, but really we mean straight edge. That's actually not a straight edge because it has marks on it. So something that you can use to draw straight lines. And so the theorems are that it's impossible, using only a compass and straight edge, to square the circle, double the cube, trisect every angle, and construct every regular polygon. So I'm going to spend a while talking about each of these four problems, tell you exactly what the problems are, uh, and then we're going to talk about um, why they're impossible. And it's a 2,000-year it's a story. So I'm going to try my best to get through 2,000 years in uh, 50 minutes. So I'll try my best. Just to make you aware of what the context is here, we're talking about these ruler and compass problems. Uh, you probably encountered this in high school. So your teacher may have given you a line segment like this and said, use only a compass and straight edge to bisect this line segment, or draw a perpendicular bisector to this line segment. And so just to illustrate, you could draw a circle, draw another circle, and connect those two points together. And that, gave, that gives you a perpendicular bisector for your line segment. So using only a compass and straight edge, we're able to solve this problem. Okay. So is this, uh, does this remind you of high school? Did you learn about this, this compass and straight edge problem? So that's sort of the context for the rest of these. So let's talk about them one at a time. Probably the most famous is the problem of squaring the circle. And so uh, we'll articulate the problem this way. Uh, is it possible, using only a compass and straight edge, to construct a square that has the same area as a given circle? So if I handed you this circle, and let's say I even told you where the center of this circle was, and I gave you a compass and straight edge, could you construct a square that has the same area as this circle? So in this case, it would be that square. Could you construct that square using only a compass and straight edge? So let's show you, let me show you how such a thing might be done with a compass and straight edge. Let's say I ask you to square this triangle. All right, so we want to construct a square that has the same area as this triangle using only a compass and straight edge. Well, we know that the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. So I could at least construct a rectangle with the same area as this triangle. I could give it the same base and half the height. And I won't walk you through all the steps. Uh, I guess I will. You drop that, <laughs> you, can, you can bisect this, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't show you all the steps. But uh, you can bisect the perpendicular and use that to get the height of this rectangle. We saw on the previous slide how you construct perpendiculars, and you could use your compass and straight edge to construct this rectangle. So we're partway there. We've constructed a rectangle that has the same area as this triangle. But we really wanted a square. Um, the square procedure is a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm going to show it to you relatively quickly. If you went and sort of slowly marched through this thing, um, you could convince yourself that this square has the same area as the rectangle. So we draw that line segment, draw that circle. Uh, we bisect that line segment and draw that circle. We can extend this line up and then turn that guy into a square. And if you sort of follow through all the various steps here, it turns out that that square has the same area as the rectangle, and the rectangle has the same area as the triangle, and so therefore we have squared the triangle. Um, this was sort of the, the Greek analog of integrating. If they wanted to square something, that was really the equivalent of computing the area of an object. So squaring the circle is really like finding the area of the circle. Okay? 
Um, so let's go back to the original problem here. Um, let's say that we had a circle. Let's just say that it has uh, area one, uh, radius one. What's the area of this circle going to be? Pi, right? So the circle has an area of pi. So we want a square that has the same area as the circle. So the side length of the square will be square root of pi, right? So this is basically what we want to do. We want to start with a circle of radius 1, for example, and construct a square with side length square root of pi. So really, I can boil this problem down to something very, very concrete. Given a line segment of length 1, can we construct a line segment of length square root of pi using only compass and straight edge? Um, so all four of these stories are going to end with a number. And I'm not going to write much on the board, but I'll write these four numbers here. So the square root of pi. We want to know, can we construct a line segment of length square root of pi? If we can, then we will be able to square the circle. Okay. <coughs> so that is the first of our problems. Uh, the second one is the doubling of the cube problem, also called the Delian problem. Um, as you may know, if you've taken a history of math class, uh, we know some things about Greek mathematics, uh, but uh, our records are rather thin, and so a lot of what we have are just stories and anecdotes. And one of the anecdotes was that there was a plague that had hit Athens, and people wanted to uh, figure out how to make it go away. And so they visited the oracle at Delos and said, how should we do this? And they said, uh, you should double the size of this cube-shaped altar for Apollo. And so they, they doubled the length of this side, and doubled the length of this side, and doubled the length of this side, thereby making a cube of what times the volume of the original? Eight times the original. And so the plague continued on. And apparently Plato used this as, uh, you know, as sort of an incentive to, to like, you got to keep studying math here. This is embarrassing. <laughs> and one, one author that I read said this was like the Sputnik moment, you know, when you know, the Russians went to space and the U.S. were like, come on, we got to catch up. So this was the Greek Sputnik moment. So that's the story. It's probably not true, but that's the story about it. And that's why it's called the Delian problem. So here, the problem is, uh, we start with a cube. Um, obviously, if we're doing compass and straight edge things, we can't do 3D things. So we're really focusing on the side of a cube. So if we're given the side of any cube, is it possible to construct the side of another cube where th that second cube has twice the volume? So here's our cube here. We want to construct the side length of this cube with twi twice the volume. Um, so again, like I did with the last one, let's do an easier version. So let's say I gave you a square like this blue one, and we wanted to construct a square that has twice the area, and we're only allowed to use a compass and straight edge. Well, let's say just arbitrarily that our original square had side length one, so it has area one. The square we want to construct has area two, and so the side length of that square is the square root of two. And so just like the squaring of the circle, we can boil this down to line segments. Given a line segment of length one, can we construct a line segment of length square root of 2 using only a compass and straight edge? So let's go back to our square. Here's our square. Can you construct a line segment of length square root of 2 for me using only a compass yeah. and straight edge? Yes. Yeah, this is really easy, right? Just draw the diagonal. There's our line segment of length square root of 2. And so this red square has twice the area of the original square. So doubling the square is almost trivial, right? Very easy. And we do have to draw the square but uh, it's very easy. And so you think it might be just as easy to double a cube. So again, let's say we had a cube of volume one. We want a cube of volume two. And so what is the side length of our red cube going to have to be if this is going to have volume two? Cube root, cube root of two, right. And so our, our question is, given a line segment of length one, can we construct a line segment of length cube root of two using only compass and straight edge. So our second number that we're going to be interested in is the cube root of 2. So if we are able to do that, then we will be able to solve the doubling of the cube problem. Okay. So that's our second problem. The third one is the angle trisection problem. So here, someone hands you some arbitrary angle and a compass and a straight edge. And they said, can you use the compass and straight edge to trisect the angle, so to divide, to divide it into three equal angles. Okay? So this is the angle trisection problem. Um, as we did with the other ones, let's look at a simpler problem. 
here's, a, here's a, an angle. We want to bisect this angle using only a compass and straight edge. So again, this is probably something that you learned in high school. This was one of the elementary constructions that you learn in a geometry class. And so I'll, I'll illustrate this for you. Uh, first, we can draw any circle we want here. Let's say that one. Draw that circle. We can draw that circle. And then that gives us these crosshairs. And we can draw this line segment. And that will bisect the angle. So again, um, you, I would guess that many of you probably can just remember doing this. This is one of these elementary constructions. So bisecting an angle is easy. Surely trisecting an angle is easy as well, right? You would think. Uh, so let's look at it a little bit more closely. Uh, let's, let's sort of work in reverse. Let's say we were able to trisect an angle. So here's our angle. Let's say we were able to construct uh, this angle of uh, size theta over 3. Uh, what I want to do now is draw a unit circle around uh, this point here, so a, a circle with radius 1. Okay. Uh, then we, we know how to draw perpendiculars, so let's drop a perpendicular down here. And that's a little right triangle. The small angle is theta. The hypotenuse is 1. And so the side length of this is uh, cosine of theta over 3. And that's from here to that, the foot of the perpendicular, not all the way out to the circle. So that line segment is cosine of theta over 3. Right? So this was, if you were able to try a second angle, then you would be able to construct this line segment of cosine of theta over 3. Um, but if you think about it, um, we could do all that in reverse. So if we had an angle, we could construct cosine theta over 3. We could draw a line up to where it meets the circle. And we could draw the, the ray that goes out there. And that would create this angle theta over 3. So this whole thing could be reversed. This process could be reversed. And so really, just like the other ones, we can boil this down to a number. In this case, our number depends on theta. But it says, if you give me uh, a line segment of length 1 and some theta, can we construct a line segment of length cosine theta over 3? And if we can, then uh, it's possible to trisect any angle. So uh, here, the third number I'm going to write here is cosine of theta over And lastly, we have one more problem. And this is, uh, it's actually a family of problems, constructing regular polygons. So if you were handed a compass and straight edge, um, you could be asked to construct an equilateral triangle, or a square, or a pentagon, or a hexagon, or whatever. And so are we able to do these? Are we not able to do these? Can we do some and not others? Um, usually, um, if, if we're talking about what the Greeks did, usually they were constructing them inside of a circle. So, inscribing them in a circle. And so the question is, is it possible to use a compass and straight edge and uh, be able to construct every regular polygon? OK? <clears throat> so let's look at some of these here. So the hexagon is probably the easiest of these, and you can construct it. There's a neat fact about uh, a hexagon. If, if I took a circle like this and I inscribed a regular hexagon, um, do you know what the relationship is between the radius of the circle and the side length of the hexagon? They're, they're going to be the same, right? So you can use that fact to construct the hexagon in a relatively straightforward manner. If I draw that circle, then uh, it's going to give me a point on the hexagon. And you kind of keep going around here using these circles um, and put this together to construct this regular hexagon. So just use the radius of the circle to create the side length of the regular hexagon. So in a relatively short fashion, you can construct a regular hexagon. So this is definitely not an impossible problem. They're not all impossible, for example. Um, if I gave you this, is there another one you could get almost immediately? Triangle. The triangle, yeah. So if you have this, you could connect every other one to get an equilateral triangle. So right there, we got two without too much effort. OK? So let's go back to our chart here. So what can we construct? Uh, I don't know if you've spent any time looking for, through Euclid's elements, um, but it's, you should if you haven't and if you're interested in math. But he actually goes through and shows you how to construct a bunch of these. So we just saw that you could construct the equilateral triangle. Um, a square is not too hard. If you took any diameter of the circle and drew the perpendicular bisector, that would be another diameter. And if you constructed, uh, connected the four points, that would give you the square. That's pretty easy. Uh, the pentagon, turns out you can do, it's, it's relatively complicated, uh, but you can construct a pent you can inscribe a pentagon in a circle with just a compass and straight edge. 
Uh, we saw the hexagon just now. Uh, so we can do the hexagon. Uh, the other thing that you can do is if you have one of these polygons, you could draw a line segment from the center out to two adjacent uh, edges on the polygon. You can bisect the angle, and you could use that to double the number of sides. You could, uh, you know, you could double the equilateral triangle to get the uh, uh, hexagon, etc. You could double the, the square to get an octagon, etc. And so you, know, you could get two times four, which is eight. You could get two times five, which is a, a ten gon. Two times six, which gives you a twelve gon. Uh, two times eight, which gives you a sixteen gon, etc. So I, I don't think Euclid ever said that explicitly, but I'm sure if you asked him, he'd say, oh yeah, that's obvious. So um, relatively quickly, we could get three, four, five, um, and then powers of two times each one of these. These are all in Euclid's elements. There's one more that's in Euclid's elements. It turns out that three and five are prime numbers. Obviously, three and five are prime numbers, which means they're relatively prime to each other, which means that you could take an equilateral triangle and a pentagon and inscribe them in the same circle so that two of their vertices line up. And then between one point of the equilateral triangle and one point of the pentagon, that would be the side of a 15 gon, right? And then you could sort of continue that around all the way uh, around the perimeter. So you can get the, the 15 gon, which is really the 3 times 5 gon. And then you could double that, et cetera. And so by 300 BC, by the end of Euclid's, when Euclid wrote his elements, these were the, the polygons that were known to be constructible by compass and straight edge. Okay? And by the end of the Greek period, that was it. So Archimedes, for example, was not able to uh, construct anymore. So for many, many years, the green ones were constructible. The yellow ones, we didn't know. Okay? Uh, I'd like to have a number to add to this, uh, to this list here for the regular polygons. Um, it turns out it's a very similar conversation that we had for the angle uh, trisection. But instead of theta over 3, it's 2 pi over n because we're dividing the circle, which is 2 pi, into n equal parts. And so it's really going to boil down to, uh, can, we construct, uh, can we construct a segment of length cosine 2 pi over n using only a compass of square edge? <clears throat> OK? Um, so, so that's sort of the setup for it. Um, you may be asking yourself, who cares? right? Why compass and straight edge? What's the big deal? Um, and what I hear often is, uh, well, it's beautiful that you can do these things with only these uh, compass and straight edge. Um, it's because it's so simple. It's really elegant that you can do all this math. And I think these are correct answers, um, especially, um, especially this simplicity argument. Um, if you think about ancient cultures where they didn't have much in the way of technology, it's relatively easy to draw a straight line. It's relatively easy to draw a circle. Like you could take a piece of string and a, you know, and a pencil or you know, a stick and draw it in the sand. So uh, compass and straight edge are sort of natural tools to use. So that, these, these are correct answers. Um, but I, I really claim that that's not, that's not the reason that this belief persisted for so long, that compass and straight edge were so nice. Um, really, I would like to turn back to Euclid's elements. Um, so if, if you have read Euclid's elements, you'll see that he starts out with five postulates. These are five assumptions that he uses to prove everything in, uh, in his book. And let's look at what these, these five postulates are. The first one is that you should be able to draw a straight line from any point to any point. Right? That's using a straight edge. Right? So there's our straight edge. This one says to produce a finite straight line continuous in a, in a straight line. So you can extend a line segment. Right? Again, this is a straight edge. And three, that you can describe a circle with any center and any radius. And there is your compass. And so really, why compass and straight edge? Well, this is sort of the assumptions that all of this Greek mathematics was built from. These were the assumptions. Um, there are two more postulates here that I haven't listed. Um, uh, the fourth is kind of boring, and the fifth one is very interesting. The fourth <coughs> is that all right, right angles are equal to one another. Um, this has to do with how Euclid defined right angle. And five, if you can see I left a lot of space here. It says blah, 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 blah. I could give a whole hour long plus talk on the fifth postulate. Um, this wrapped up in this discussion is non-Euclidean geometries and other things like that. Um, this is called the parallel postulate. Um, and so th there's an interesting talk right there. 
But really, I want to focus on one, two, and three. And this is my answer to why compass and straight edge. Because these are the postulates that, um, that the Greek mathematics and mathematics for many years afterwards were built upon. I guess why these three postulates, then it probably goes back to the fact that these were the tools of the day, these are the elementary tools of the day, etc. OK, so this is the setup, right? I've told you what the Greeks knew about these, these problems. So now let's turn to early solutions. I put solutions in quotation marks. I told you that these are impossible. So you might ask, how are you going to show me solutions to this? Well, it turns out if you tweak the rules a little bit, you are able to solve some of these problems. So the first one is due to Archimedes, who you know, is one of, the, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And what Archimedes uh, noticed was that if you took a straight edge, and your straight edge had one mark on it, any mark, anywhere, he could trisect an angle. Um, sometimes when you read it, they say that you need two marks on there. Um, it depends whether, so here when I say one mark, it's one mark, and you know where the end of the straight edge is. If you didn't know where the end of the straight edge is, you need two marks on it. And so let me show you Archimedes' elegant method of trisecting an angle using a marked straight edge. So uh, he put the straight edge down here, extended this line segment, okay, and then drew a circle that has a center at the um, corner point for the angle and has the radius that is the length of that marked segment. Okay, so uh, it needs to have this length here. And so I'm kind of using the marked straight edge here, but not really, not in any non-Euclidean way. So, so far, so far I haven't done anything too amazing. This, this isn't really uh, that fascinating yet. It's the next step where he really uses the, the nature of the marked straight edge. So here's what Archimedes did next. He said, what I want to do is take this straight edge and I want to slide this tip along the, end, along the line here. And I want to keep contact with this point right here on the circle. And I want to keep moving until this point reaches this circle here. So I will illustrate that for you. So you slide this along here to get that point there. Uh, and that is what you cannot do with an ordinary compass and straight edge. Um, this became known as a nuisance construction or verging or something like that. So this is this, this, uh, this trick where you are lining up a line and a point and a curve where the distance between the line and the curve is this fixed distance here. So if you can do that, and you draw this line segment here, it turns out that this angle is theta over 3. So if you have one mark on your straight edge, you can trisect any angle. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise to you to show that you can do this. Um, if you want to prove this, just draw a, um, draw a line segment right here. And you'll see that you'll have a bunch of isosceles triangles, right? Because this has length equal to the radius. This has length equal to the radius. This has length equal to the radius. This has length equal the radius, and you can just play around with these triangles here, and you can see relatively easily that this really is uh, the trisect of the angle. So the great Archimedes was almost able to solve this problem, but he needed a mark on the straight edge. So that is one of the early solutions. Um, there was another whole class of solutions, many, many of them, where they said, all right, suppose I have a compass and a straight edge, and I have one more curve. If I have one more curve, then I can trisect an angle, or I can square the circle, or double the cube, et cetera. So examples would be if I have a compass and straight edge, and I have a hyperbola, or I have a compass and a straight edge, and I have one spiral, et cetera. Then I can solve some of these problems. So I thought I would illustrate with one specific example. Um, so this is a cool one. This is called the quadratrix. Um, and this was due to a relatively early Greek, 5th century BCE. That was well before Euclid. Um, and so he said, if you give me this quadratrix, I can trisect any angle. Um, so what I have here in this picture is a square. And this is, that's not the quadratrix. That's just uh, a quarter of a circle. So that's a quarter of a circle. And so what I'm going to do to draw this quadratrix is um, this, this line segment here I'm going to let this line segment fall like a tree tipping over. So it's going to fall down like this. This line segment up here, I'm going to have this fall just vertically downward. And where those two things cross, I'm going to trace out the curve. So I'm going to show it to you. And every time I've given this talk, people are like, can you show me that again? So I'll show it to you twice, or more if you want to see it. So here we go. These things are falling, and this is going to trace out that curve. Can we see that again? OK, yeah, so again, this, this line segment here is going to be falling down like this. 
and that top one is going to be falling down like this, so that they arrive at the bottom at the same time. And the curve that they, their curve of intersection is this quadratrix. So this is going to fall down like this. Okay? So that is the quadratrix. So what Hippias of Ellis said is if you give me a compass and straight edge and this quadratrix, I can trisect any angle. Um, and actually, when you see the solution, you'll see it was sort of specifically made for this purpose. Right? So here's our angle. Let's say we want to trisect this angle theta. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, draw a perpendicular over to this left-hand side from that point of intersection. And when I wrote A there, I mean that, that the distance there is A. So it turns out trisecting angles is hard, but trisecting line segments is easy. So I can trisect that line segment down there, and I can, I can draw a line segment where this is uh, one-third of the way up. So that's uh, A over 3. Uh, and then if I draw this line segment here, then I claim that that angle is, is theta over 3. So at first you might say, that's amazing. But when you think about it, that's actually not that amazing. It was sort of set up for this, right? This one is going to fall down here in 2 thirds of the time. And this is going to fall down here in 2 thirds of the time. And so that is going to be theta over 3, right? Kind of by the way we drew this blue curve. Um, it's sort of made to trisect angles. Um, so this was 5th century BCE. You, uh, Hippias of Ellis showed that if you were given one other curve, then you could trisect any angles. And I showed you all those other curves. There were similar types of arguments for each one of those. Uh, this has a name that's called the quadratrix. Uh, did you think that this was going to be angle trisection with a name like the quadratrix? Which, which problem do you think this was going to solve? Squaring the circle, yeah. It's often the squaring of object is often called quadrature. So you often want to uh, do the quadrature. And it turned out this was probably named later, and it was discovered later that you could actually use this to square the circle. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. We don't know who first did it. We think it was probably Nicomedes. Um, so this is like post Archimedes. Uh, so this is relatively late. Um, and so it turns out that if that vertical line segment had length 1, then that green line segment there would have length uh, 2 over pi. And so you could construct 2 over pi, which means you could construct pi, which means you could construct square root of pi, which means you could square, with the, square the circle. So I'm leaving a bunch of steps out here. But it turns out you can use this quadratrix to square the circle as well. Okay. Um, so this is the kind of thing that the Greeks did. They wished that they could solve it using only compass and straight edge. They were unable to do it. But then they employed all these other things to try to solve these problems. But they're all sort of cheating, in a way. Okay? And this is how things uh, were for many, many years. Um, and uh, when the Europeans started to become interested in math again and started to study the Greeks, they started to become interested in these problems. Um, they also uh, relied very heavily on Euclid's elements. And so the compass and straight edge were very important. And they also were, had trouble with these, um, with these classical problems. And it turns out that the end of the story is that we don't have any geometric proofs that these are impossible. All of the proofs that these are impossible require algebra. And so really, the, the next time that any serious um, progress was made in solving these problems was after algebra was born. Um, and so I call this algebra and a new view of numbers. Um, and so I found this really interesting quote in the notices of the AMS. Uh, by Sir Michael Atia, who's a famous mathematician. And uh, he's talking about this transition from geometry to algebra. So there was this period uh, with like Viet and Descartes and Fermat, where they were starting to move away from geometry and were starting to invent this, this field of algebra and use it. And you lose a lot, but you gain a lot. And so this is what Sir Michael Atia wrote. This was from 2001. I, I'll read it to you. Uh, there's a lot here, but it's, it's a cool quote. So it says, Algebra is to the geometer what you might call the Faustian offer. Algebra is the offer made by the devil to the mathematician. The devil says, I will give you this powerful machine. It will answer any question you like. All you need to do is give me your soul. Give up geometry, and you'll have this marvelous machine. Of course, we like to have things both ways. We'd probably cheat on the devil, pretend we're selling our soul, and not give away. Nevertheless, the danger to our soul is there, because when you pass over the algebraic calculation, essentially you stop thinking. You stop thinking geometrically. You stop thinking about the meaning. So this was in 2001, and this this definitely reflects the, the mood of the day. You know when Descartes and Fermat and Viet were starting to 
uh, turn math from geometry into algebra. It's like, all right, we're able to prove some new things, but I'm really uneasy about this. And I was uh, joking with my colleagues at the lunch table that actually this reminds me of the current conversation about moving towards calculators. You know, all the old professors are like, I don't know about using calculators. We're going to forget how to do this or that or this or that. And it was really very similar to this conversation of moving from geometry to algebra. Um, so, but this is the way it had to be to solve these problems. Um, so I, my slide was algebra and a new view of numbers. Let's talk about this new view of numbers. Um, so let's talk about Rene Descartes. Um, so one of Descartes' many contributions was that he gave a way of doing arithmetic using line segments. So this is going to seem really bizarre to you, but this is, this is one of his main contributions. And uh, I'm teaching a history of math class this semester, and I had my students read the first two or three pages of Descartes' geometry, and he lays out this plan just in those first few, first few pages. And it's really interesting to read. And so Descartes showed how you could add and subtract line segments. That's nothing special. He showed how to multiply line segments, how to divide line segments, and how to take the square root of line segments. So behind the scenes here is that the Greek view of math is that a magnitude isn't a number, a magnitude is a line segment. So we would think of it as the length of a line segment, but they really literally thought of it as a line segment. So adding and subtracting line segments is relatively straightforward, uh, but multiplying line segments, uh, oh, this is going to allow us to do geometry algebra. So multiplying line segments, the way the Greeks would do it is say, okay, I want to multiply A and B. If I multiply A and B, I get an area, and the area is A times B. So you multiply these two lengths, and you get an area, right? Which seems kind of, that seems like the way you would want to do it. Um, but we are used to multiplying numbers and getting a number back, right? And so Descartes was the first person to really say you could do this. You could multiply two lengths and get a length. So let me show you his construction here of how you would multiply A and B and get another line segment. So um, he had one other, I should say, he had one other invention. And this it seems obvious, but it's really crucial to this discussion. His invention was the number one. So he said, I will tell you how to multiply A and B as long as you tell me how long one is. So if you give me a unit line segment, I can tell you how to multiply A and B. So he said, draw any angle you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, draw a line segment on there of length 1. Draw a line segment of length A. Draw a line segment of length B. And I will show you how to draw a line segment, segment of length A times B. And so what he did is connected those two, drew a, a line parallel to it, and said, all right, let's focus on this length x. So what do you see here? Similar triangles. Similar triangles, yeah. So we have similar triangles here. And that tells us that uh, a is to 1 as x is to b. And therefore, x has to have length a times b. And so just like that, he said, I will now tell you how to multiply two line segments and get a line segment. And the only thing I need is this unit length. If you tell me what 1 is, I can multiply these. And if you think about it, if, you gave it, if, if I gave you a different unit length, then a times b would have a different length. Um, so this told him how to multiply line segments. Similarly, you could divide line segments. You kind of just move those things around a little bit. So if we, multi if we switch those around a little bit and use similar triangles, that's A divided by B. Uh, you could also take square roots of line segments. Those re require circles. It's relatively easy to do, but I think I'll, I'll skip it for the top. And so the point is that if we have a line segment of length 1, and if you gave me a line segment, uh, if you gave me a number A that was positive, um, and if that number A can be represented with plus, minus, times, division, and square roots, then I can use a compass and straight edge to draw a line segment of that length, right? Because if you start with 1, you can get all the integers. And if you can multiply and divide uh, and take square roots, you can get anything that is written in terms of those things. And conversely, uh, if you think about it, if all you have to work with are lines and circles, think about algebra. You want to find the point of intersection of two lines, or the point of intersection of two circles, or the point of intersection of a line in a circle. If you did the algebra, at worst, you'd be solving a quadratic equation. So at worst, you'd have square roots in there. And so, um, so if you are looking at what points are constructible, then at worst, you're going to be dealing with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots. 
And so, although Descartes never stated it in this way, uh, we could now write a theorem from what he wrote, which was that a number A is constructible if and only if it can be formed from the integers using plus, minus, times, division, and the square roots. So in other words, if I start with a line segment of length 1, and I want to construct a line segment of length absolute value 1, then that number has to be expressible using the four arithmetic operations and the square root. And so now you might be seeing where this is going to come into play here. So let's just make sure we understand this. So uh, does anyone know this number? Yes. Yeah, the famous number? Game. Golden ratio. So is the golden ratio constructible using a compass and straight edge? Yes. Uh, yes, because you may even know how to do it. But also yes, because from Descartes' theorem, it's constructible because it's only written using addition, uh, square roots, and division. Right? So therefore, this must be constructible. Okay? Uh, I'm going to show you another famous number. Is this famous number? I'm just kidding. It's not famous. <laughs> is this number constructible? If I gave you a line segment of length 1 and a compass and straight edge, could you construct for me a line segment that has that length? Yeah. Yes. In principle, you could. Right? So in principle, that is a constructible number. Okay? By Descartes' theorem. Okay? Uh, what about that one? Is that constructible? Yeah. Yeah. It has a fourth root, though. Square. It's a square root of a square root, right? So yes, that is a constructible number. Uh, what about this one? So now we're really getting to the, the, the point of the matter. Is this a constructible number? Remember, it's an if only a theorem. Yeah? Try multiplying it by itself three times and then square root that. Yeah. Well, but, uh, but we can't go in that direction. We have to go in the reverse direction. We have to be, so the question is, can we write the cube root of 2 using only addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots? It feels like the answer is no, but I don't feel like that's a proof. It just feels like the answer is no. And just to make sure, just to see why we're uncomfortable about this, this also looks like the answer should be no, right? The cube root of 7 plus 5 root 2. But, and if you're bored during my talk, you can check and see that these are the same. So if you cube the left-hand side, you get 7 plus 5 root 2. If you cube the right-hand side, you're also going to get 7 plus 5 root 2. So it's not, it's not just a matter of looking at it. You would somehow have to prove that it's not constructible. Right? And finally, the last one here is pi. Is pi a constructible number? Can you write this using the four operations in square roots? Again, it feels like the answer is no, but we don't have a proof. So, it feels like we're kind of getting close to the answer to say that these are impossible, but we still have some work to do. Okay? <clears throat> so let's talk about how these were proven to be impossible. Um, so first is the constructing of regular polygons. And actually the hero of this story is uh, Gauss. Uh, this is like Matt's greatest hits here. I've already given you Archimedes and Euclid and Descartes, <laughs> and now we've got Gauss here. So it turns out, uh, how many of you are 19 years old or younger? So a bunch of you. So it turns out that when Gauss was 19 years old, he, construct, he constructed the regular 17 gon. So this was one of the yellow ones on the original slide. Gauss showed that, actually he didn't construct it, he showed that it was constructible. And so remember, what do we want to do? We want to show that cosine of 2 pi over 17 is a constructible number, right? So it turns out, I was actually lying to you, that is a famous number, right? So the cosine of 2 pi over 17 is that big and complicated thing. So Gauss proved that, and he knew, he knew his Descartes. He knew that that meant that cosine of 2 pi over 17 was constructible. Therefore, he knew that the 17 gon was constructible. And he was very proud of this. He actually wanted this to be on his tombstone. Uh, but apparently the, the engraver uh, actually thought about it and said, and it looks too much like a circle, and it wouldn't really work. There's actually a monument in Brunswick, a more modern one, where they have like a 17-pointed star on it. Um, so you could actually see it. Um, so actually, this picture of Gauss that I have here, this is actually from a stamp that my wife found for me on eBay. So here's the full stamp. And you can see the stamp has the 17 gone, and has the, the, the compass, and it has the straight edge on it. So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> so here's what Gauss wrote. This was, by the way, this was at the end. This appeared at the very end of one of his uh, great works. And here's what he wrote about it. He says, it seems that one has persuaded oneself ever since Euclid's time that the domain of elementary geometry could not be extended. At least I do not know of any success successful attempts to enlarge its boundaries on this side. 
It seems to me then to be all the more remarkable that besides the usual polygons, there's a collection of others which are constructible geometrically. For example, the 17 gon. So that's pretty awesome. So it was not just the 17 gon, it was a bunch of them. So let's talk a little bit more about that. We, we could have a long conversation about this, uh, and it will lead us a little bit astray to do it. But let me just tell you a little bit about what these constructible polygons are. Uh, it turns out there's this number called a Fermat prime. So there's an interesting story that Fermat thought every number of this form had to be prime. And it was prime, it's prime when uh, n equals 0, and n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. Turns out that these are all prime numbers here. Uh, and that's how things were when Fermat ended. Turns out that any, n equals 5, 1 is not uh, prime. And another famous mathematician factored it. Does anyone know who that famous mathematician Euler. is? Euler. Euler, yeah. So Euler famously factored the, uh, the n equals 5 Fermat number. Um, so if you look right here, here's our 3, here's our 5, here's our 17. 3, 5, 17. Uh, it turns out that if you are a Fermat prime, then you can construct a regular polygon with that many sides, right? Just like we could construct the 15 gon, we can also multiply these together to get some other ones. Uh, just like we can double the number of sides, we can get more, et cetera. And so it turns out that the theorem is that if n is 2 to the k times a product of distinct Fermat primes, then the regular n gon is constructible, right? So the 250, what was it, 257 gon is constructible. Um, it, there is this word here, distinct. So uh, even though 3 is a Fermat prime, 3 times 3 is not uh, a constructible polygon. And so by this theorem, oops, oh, oh, yeah, I was going to put it back up a second. So, uh, so that, uh, so here, here's, let me just read this for you. This is what Gauss wrote. He said, the limits of the present work exclude this demonstration. Uh, let, me, let me back up. So that, that theorem was if and only if, right? If you think about what I told you originally was, he said, if it had this form, then it's constructible. The converse is also the interesting part. That's what isn't constructible, right? And my theorem said that none of these other ones are constructible. It turns out Gauss never actually proved that, but he stated it. So this is what Gauss wrote. He said, the limits of the present work exclude this demonstration that the others are not constructible. But we issue this warning, and this is like typical Gauss here. We issue this warning lest anyone attempt to achieve geometric constructions for sections other than the ones suggested by our theory. For example, into 7, 11, 13, 19, et cetera, parts. And so spend his time uselessly. So this is like classic Gauss. He's like, I know the rest are impossible. I'm not going to prove it. So just you know, trust me. That you're right. <laughs> so uh, we don't know if Gauss did or did not have a proof of this. Um, so at least he stated that this was an if and only a theorem, but he really only proved one direction. So, so that was the end of this, this first impossibility theorem, that uh, these red ones are actually impossible to solve using compass and straight edge. So that, that's one of our four that is down. Um, next, let's talk about the angle trisection problem and the doubling of the cube problem. Uh, this one is going to bring in another famous mathematician, one I'm sure you've all heard of, Pierre Wansel. Yeah. Right? Yeah? All right, maybe if I show you a picture, here's Pierre Wansel. All right. <laughs> so actually, Pierre Wansel, he proved that you can't trisect every angle. He proved that you can't double the cube. He actually proved Gauss's the converse to Gauss's theorem. And we don't really know much, too much about him. We know, know a little bit about his biography. We don't have any picture of him. I went to his, his uh, Wikipedia page, and I took a screen capture. And I'll, I'm not joking. This is the entirety of Pierre Wanzel's Wikipedia page. Isn't that sad? So these famous problems, it says he solved them, but this is really the extent of his Wikipedia page. Isn't that hilarious? So poor Pierre Wanzel. Um, and actually, his name was not even really attached to these problems for about 100 years after he, he proved them. So that's sort of interesting. <clears throat> OK, so let's see. What, what exactly did Pierre Wanzel do? So remember, we're in the land of algebra now. And so our solution is going to be algebraic. And so here's his theorem. Uh, and so now we've moved on quite a bit beyond Descartes. So what Pierre Ansel proved was that if A is a constructible number, and it's the root of some irreducible polynomial with integer coefficients, then the degree of that polynomial must be a power of 2. All right, so we're just thinking about an ordinary polynomial, what you would see in a pre-count class or a calculus class. 
Uh, we're insisting that it has integer coefficients. And there's this, this bit about being irreducible. So irreducible just means you can't factor it. Um, or you can't factor it with integer coefficients. So if this number is constructible, and it's the root of some irreducible polynomial, then that polynomial must have a degree which is a power of 2. Okay? So actually, the uh, contrapositive is going to be more useful to us here. So the contrapositive would say that if a is the root of an irreducible polynomial with integer coefficients, and the degree isn't a power of 2, then a isn't constructible. right? Because we want to show that these guys are not constructible. Right? Got it? So quickly, we're going to get these, these two theorems. So the cube root of 2, remember that is our, that's our number that was associated with doubling the cube. The cube root of 2 is a root of that polynomial. I hope everyone agrees, right? If you plug it into that polynomial, you'll get 0. Um, we would have to somehow convince ourselves that this couldn't be factored, but that's actually not too hard to show that this is irreducible. And therefore, 3 is not a power of 2, and therefore, it's impossible to double the cube, just like that. So it's impossible to double the cube. <clears throat> OK, let's look at the angle trisection problem. The angle trisection problem says, is it possible to trisect any angle you give me? So to show that it can't be done, you just have to give me an example of something that can't be trisected. OK, so it turns out that cosine of 20 is the root of this uh, polynomial. Um, that may not be obvious. This is a trig identity in disguise here. So there's some trig identity lurking behind it that tells you that cosine of 20 is a root of this polynomial. Okay? And again, this polynomial has degree 3. 3 is not a power of 2. Uh, again, it's not too hard. You can show that this is irreducible. And therefore, cosine of 20 is uh, not a constructible number. Right? So if cosine of 20 is not a constructible number, what angle can, can we not try to 60. 60, right? So this shows us that it's impossible to trisect a 60 degree angle with compass and straight edge. And the, um, the proof that, uh, to clean up Gauss's proof, you can do a similar thing. It's a little bit more complicated. But you can, you can use the same theorem to, to finish off Gauss's proof. Um, and I, I've been meaning to track it down. Apparently, in Wanzel's paper, all of this appears on one piece of his, he has an article about this. And all the impossibility proofs appear on one page. So I think that would be a good addition if I can find it. Just a, a facsimile of, of that one page where he solves all of these problems. And so we've, we've now knocked down three of, the, three of the four problems. And so the last one is the hardest of them all. This is the squaring of the circle problem. Um, and so last summer I was reading this, uh, this Doris Kearns Goodwin book called A Team of Rivals, which is about Lincoln and his cabinet, et cetera. It may even be what the, the movie Lincoln is based on. I'm not sure. Is it? Yeah. Uh, and there's a, a passage in there which I thought was pretty awesome. It says, uh, Lincoln's law partner, Herndon, describes finding him, Lincoln, one day so deeply absorbed in this, his study that he scarcely looked up when I entered. Surrounded by a quantity of blank paper, large, heavy sheets, a compass, a rule, numerous pencils, several bottles of ink of various colors, and a profusion of stationery. Lincoln was apparently struggling with a calculation of some magnitude, for scattered about were sheet after sheet of paper covered with an unusual array of figures. When Herndon inquired what he was doing, he announced that he was trying to solve the difficult problem of squaring the circle. To this insoluble task posed by the ancients over 4,000 years earlier, he devoted the better part of the succeeding two days almost to the point of exhaustion. So there's actually a whole uh, there's a whole class of like kooky people that you call like circle squares or angle trisectors, people who think they can solve these problems even though they're impossible. And so you might think that Lincoln was one of these kooky circle squares, but in Lincoln's defense, the theorem hadn't been proven that at this point. This was still an open problem when Lincoln, when Lincoln was trying to square the circle. <clears throat> so really, this is going to boil down to, is the square root of pi constructible, which is equivalent to, is pi constructible. So I know we're out of time. I'm almost done here. So if we're talking about the nature of pi, Archimedes had a lot to say about pi. He gave these nice bounds, including 22 over 7. Um, a little bit later, or quite a bit later, uh, Lambert proved that pi is irrational. That's still not quite good enough. There's lots of constructible irrational numbers. And so finally, the, the problem was solved uh, by noticing that if your number is not the root of any polynomial, then your number is not constructible. And so that's called a transcendental number. And in 1882, 
uh, Lindemann proved that pi was transcendental. It's not the root of any polynomial. Therefore, it's not the root of a polynomial where the degree is a power of 2. And therefore, it's not constructible. Therefore, uh, it's impossible to square the circle with compass and straight edge. And so as my last slide here, there's the whole class of Chuck Norris jokes. So even Chuck Norris can't square the circle. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I get placed there. <laughs>